Hey everyone, this is Benjamin D. Whiting, and welcome back to the Super Collider segment of Null State's Interactive Digital Art Tutorial Series. Last week we went over installing Super Collider on Mac OS, Windows, and Linux. We also entered and evaluated our first sound producing bit of code. This week we will cover the language's idiosyncratically flexible syntax. Super Collider is a high level programming language, and like with any language, it is imperative to understand its syntax to be able to communicate with it effectively. For those of you with pre existing programming experience, it is basically a marriage of small talk with C. If you're accustomed to either one of those languages, or even other C-like languages like Java, JavaScript, and so on, it won't take too much of an adjustment period to get into the swing of things. By the way, I will be making exclusive use of the macOS build of Super Collider for the foreseeable future. It's important to know this as key commands will be slightly different than what you will need to press in the Linux and Windows builds of the IDE. I will do my best to state what keys to press for all three languages, but in case I ever forget, the rule of thumb is that key commands that begin with command in macOS will begin with control in Windows and Linux instead. Furthermore, though this is a very subtle difference, Apple makes a distinction between return and enter on their computer's keyboards, with enter being the one that's paired with the number pad. Other platforms make a distinction as well, but both keys are typically marked enter. One just has to know under what circumstances the enter key by the number pad will have different functionality. For those of you on PCs with both keys marked enter, you will need to stick to the one on the QWERTY side of things, not the number pad. Let's start by booting the server. In case you don't remember or had skipped the first episode, you can achieve this by pressing Command B or Control B on Windows or Linux. As you can see, our server has booted successfully as uh, we can tell by the messages posted in the post window and the units of measurement in the little server widget on the bottom right of the screen are happily glowing green. Now let's take a look at the code we entered last episode. Don't forget, you can stop the sound by pressing command period or control period on Windows or Linux. If this looks overwhelmingly cryptic to you, don't worry, we're going to break it down into each of its constituent parts. First, notice that a good chunk of the code is enclosed within these curly braces. All of the code involved with the construction of the sound is enclosed within these braces. This comprises what is called a function. An entire episode devoted to functions is forthcoming, but for now, it's at least important that you are aware of the term and that they are currently the primary way we're producing sound at the moment. Next, we have this bit of code colored in blue, SINOSC. Notice how it begins with a capital letter. This is an example of a super collider class, and all classes begin with capital letters. In fact, classes are the only language components that do so. Everything else we'll run across, presuming it's primarily alphanumeric by nature and not symbolic, will begin with a lowercase letter. SINOSC refers to a sine wave oscillator. This class calls upon the oscillator UGEN, UGEN being short for unit generator, and is responsible for producing the waveform. SINOSC is followed by a dot and two lowercase letters, AR. These two letters are short for audio rate and is what is known as a class method. This class method tells SINOSC to utilize the audio sampling rate when calling upon the UGEN. This doesn't actually ensure that the resulting waveform is audible, only that it makes use of the audio sampling rate upon instantiation and is potentially audible. After the AR, we find some text enclosed in parentheses. This encapsulates the arguments being passed into the SINOSC class. We'll return to arguments in the next episode, but for the purposes of understanding what's being written here, the 0.2 after mole refers to the amplitude of the sine wave, where 1 corresponds to 0 dBFS, or peak level, due to how this particular UGEN is calibrated within the language. After the closing brace, we see a dot followed by play. This is an example of an instance method, 
apply to the function class. The difference between class and instance methods is subtle, but to put it simply, a class method determines what version of the class to instantiate. For example, the audio rate version of the SinOSC UGen we instance here, whereas an instance method operates on a class that has already been instantiated. Function is a unique class in that one does not explicitly call upon it by typing out the word function, instead making use of curly braces, but it nevertheless behaves as a class would in every other respect. Here, the code contained between the braces is evaluated and instanced as a function, to which the method play is applied. As you might have guessed, dot .play is what allows for the monitoring of sound generating functions. Finally, we see at the end of this instruction a semicolon. For those of you already accustomed to programming in C and C-like languages, this is no doubt old hat. But for those of you new to programming, this is the character that signals to the interpreter that we've come to the end of a complete instruction. It's akin to the period or full stop found in many languages we humans comprehend. Unlike many C-like programming languages, the semicolon and superclider is not strictly necessary in all situations. You can omit the semicolon for the final instruction in a chunk of code, or not use it at all when compiling code that is only one instruction long. That said, it is still best to get into the habit of including a semicolon at the end of every instruction, as it minimizes the appearance of compilation errors down the line when one invariably adds to their code base. Not that I'm speaking from personal experience, of course. So, in summary, what we're telling SuperCollider here is that we want a function containing a sine wave oscillator, instanced at the audio sampling rate, set to 20% of peak level. Once this function has been instanced, play the function over the default hardware output. We could stop there, but remember what I had hinted at during the beginning of this video? That's right, it turns out there is more than one way to skin a cat. SuperCollider is fairly unusual as a programming language in that programmers have a choice of how they want to syntactically order their instructions. Let's once again look at our Hello World example. We could have phrased it this way instead. The result is exactly the same, but we're putting functions instance method, the verb if you will, at the beginning of the instruction instead of ending with it. So now we're phrasing it as such. We want SuperCollider to play an instance of a function containing a sine wave oscillator, instanced at the audio sampling rate, set to 20% of peak level. This is an example of function call notation commonly found in C-like languages. As a rule of thumb, x.method is equivalent to method parentheses x. This can be extended further in our Hello World example, giving us the following. Here we're telling SuperCollider to play an instance of a function containing an audio rate instanced class, that being SinOSC, and played at 20% of peak level. So while this works, one will almost never see it in practice, with people preferring function call notation to nevertheless keep class methods like .ar, following the classes to be instanced. Our function call variant can instead be written like this. As you can see here, we're omitting the parentheses. This is because instance methods of function, or instance methods of other classes that allow for a function as its first argument, provided none of the other arguments have values other than their defaults, allow the programmer to dispense with the parentheses, as all relevant code is enclosed within the function's curly braces anyway. 
Finally, it should be noted that in Super Collider, the amount of white space used doesn't matter, so long as white space isn't included within individual elements such as class names, integers, floats, and so on. This mirrors what can be observed among many other text-based programming languages. For example, this could just as easily be written as the following with minimal white space. Or it could be written like this. Though this is pretty absurd, when writing code, one should strive for legibility, and this is barely legible. White space includes carriage returns, by the way. This example is a very common way of expressing code, especially when what is enclosed within bracketing punctuation is long enough to not comfortably fit on one line. Incidentally, I happen to like appending a semicolon even to single instruction sets within a function when written in this fashion, though as mentioned before, it isn't strictly necessary. You may have noticed by now that executing this code results in errors posted to the post window. This is because pressing shift return or shift enter on Windows or Linux will only execute code residing on the line your cursor happens to be. In order to execute multiple lines of code at once, you have two options. You can highlight the lines you want executed like so and then depress shift return or the far more convenient method. First, enclose the chunk of code you want to execute in parentheses like so. Now you can put your cursor anywhere within the parentheses and press Command Return or Control Enter on Windows or Linux instead of Shift Return. You should see the relevant three lines of code flash indicating their successful execution, as well as hear the sign tone I'm sure you're tiring of just as quickly as I am. Okay, this about wraps it up for our episode on Super Collider Syntax. Next week, we'll be going over that all-important topic in programming, working with variables. In the meantime, please don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to this channel to show your support for more interactive digital music and art content from us at Null State. Also, make sure to check out our Facebook page and webpage to stay up to date on all of our upcoming events, workshops, and concerts. Links being in the description below. Until next Tuesday!